It's becoming increasingly common to start using machine learning or AI-driven techniques to make decisions right, the world over. So, for example, you know, credit checks, health checks, and these can be life-changing, right? So it's really important we get this right. You could find yourself turned down for a mortgage on your dream house because, quite literally, the computer says no. Let's talk a little bit about classification. So now we have a data set where we've got labels. Right? So we've got some input features or input attributes or dimensions, lots of instances, and we've got some labels for these attributes. Right? And so we've got, for example, books and the type of book or music and the genre of the music, things that we want to start to try and classify. So supervised learning is the idea that we've got labels for our data. So we're still going to have instances, we're going to have attributes or dimensions to our instances, but we've also now got labels for our data. Right? And so classification is the process of learning how to correctly assign these labels to these instances. Before we start talking about classifiers, let's talk a little bit about the learning process or the machine learning process we want to use. It's not enough to say, I've got my data set and I can correctly predict all of the classes. Right? Because then someone will ask, well, what happens if we have any new data that we haven't seen before? Right? Maybe you've got some medical data and you can correctly diagnose all of the diseases, but a new patient comes along and you incorrectly diagnose the disease. Right? That's not helped anyone. What we need is a regimented way of training and testing these approaches so that we know how well they apply in the real world. So what we're going to do is we've got some data set just like before where we've got some instances and we've got some attributes this way. And so, you know, we might have a lot of attributes, a few, it doesn't really matter. And we also now have our labels, which we often call Y, right? But this is going to be a vector of all of the labels for our data. So this could be label one, one, these could be a few twos down here, and these could be a few threes. So this is a bit like our tennis example where we had, this is the weather outlook, and are we going to play tennis today, right? Yes or no. So that you can have multiple labels or just two for binary classification. It's not enough just to train a classifier over all this data. We want to make sure that this classifier will work properly when we apply new data to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate this data into training sets, validation and testing sets. So we're going to train on the training set, then we're going to test as we go on the validation set, and then right at the end when we're finished, we're going to do a final test on our test set. The reason we do this is it's a very safe way to make sure that we don't accidentally game the system. We don't accidentally report incredibly good results on the training set, but that's because we all just showed the machine those things. So we hold out the validation of a test set for later to make sure that it will generalize. Now exactly how much of your data goes in the training, validation and testing set is really up to you, right? Typically you might use something like 70% for training, 15% for validation and 15% for testing. That would be quite a reasonable way of doing it. So what are some good classifiers we could use given that we've done this, right? So let's imagine we've got our instances, we've got our attributes and we split them up probably randomly into training, validation and testing. Right. What we want to do is train our classifier on the training set and then test it on the validation and testing sets to see how we're getting on. So what algorithms could we use? Let's start with the simplest one of all, 0R. In 0R, we just take the most common label and that's what we predict every time. It's the, you've got five minutes until the deadline, just hand something in approach to machine learning. In the case of playing tennis or not playing tennis, we could say, well, I, I played tennis more than I didn't, so we'll just assume that I'm going to play tennis and predict yes all the time, right, regardless of what the weather is. This is not a good way to perform machine learning, but I suppose it does give you a baseline accuracy. Right? If your baseline of just yet saying yes to everything is 60% accuracy, then if your machine learning doesn't perform at least at 60%, we know we've got a real problem. We can go one better than that. We can use 1R. 1R is where we pick one of our attributes, we make a classification based only on that, and then we pick the best of those attributes. I mean, it's slightly better than 0R, but not a lot. Right? So you'll find, you'll find references to these in the literature a little bit, but not very much because we use much more powerful approaches to this. So let's talk about one example classifier that's very popular, and that's KNN, or K nearest neighbor. Let's imagine we've got a two attribute data set. So I like to draw in two dimensions, just a little bit easier for me. And so we've got attribute one and attribute two, and we've got some different data points in here. Now, don't forget also that each of these is going to have a prediction as well. So this one here, it's going to have, let's say, a label of we did play tennis. When we want to test a new data point, an unseen data, so a new person comes along who may or may not play tennis, they're going to appear over here. We measure them and we find the k number of nearest neighbours to this point. So that's this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So this will be one, two, three, four, five, six. This will be k of six. And then we take the majority vote or the average of these responses. So if four out of six of these people played tennis, this would be assigned to play tennis. So the output is what 
in the existing data set have we already seen nearby and can we use that to make a prediction? Right. So this is quite a good approach. Obviously choosing K is a little bit difficult to do. Right? And this starts to get very, very slow when you've got hundreds and hundreds of dimensions. Finding the k nearest points to a point when you've got tens of thousands of dimensions or tens of thousands of instances is not easy to do, even with good data structures. Right? It starts to get slow quite quickly. Nevertheless, this is an effective and popular approach. Are there any alternatives? There is one, decision trees. Right? Now, I like decision trees. They have a nice benefit that once we've created a decision tree, right, which is just a series of decisions on, is the data this? Yes. Is it this? No. Once we've done all that, we can actually look at the rules and say, OK, that's how a decision was made, and that's quite a good rule set. So it's kind of a way of writing a sort of if-else programming language, but you're doing it automatically. Let's draw out another data set. So we've got our instances down here, and we've got our attributes here. And remember, for each of our instances, we're going to have some label that we're trying to output. Right, so here, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So let's imagine that this is a credit score, right, a credit check. So you've got attributes based on how much money you've got, how much you've spent recently, if you already have other loans. Right? And what we want to do is make a decision as to whether you should be allowed more credit or not. Right? So the answer is yes or no, quite simply. So a decision tree is going to partition the data up based on the attributes. So let's say the first rule is credit rating. Credit rating, you know, greater than or equal to five, question mark. And if the answer is yes, we continue. If the answer is no, then we actually output a leaf node here which says credit denied. Here we say, okay, so the credit rating is above five. It's not a no yet. Now we say, okay, do they earn more than, let's say, 10,000 a year or something like that? And if the answer is yes, we proceed to the next stage. If it's no, then they don't earn enough credit denied. Right? This is what a decision tree does. Now, you don't have to design this yourself. There are algorithms to produce decision trees for you. The way they will work is they will pick one of these attributes at each level that best separates the data out. So, for example, you've got a lot of different instances of yes and no decisions in your training set. Is credit rating the best way of separating out the yeses and the noes? And one of them is going to be best for each individual step. And we can use all of them in a tree structure like this until we get to a series of leaf nodes which end up with only yeses and only noes. And then it's very simple to apply this. When new data comes along, we apply these rules and we get to a decision. A decision tree is going to be equivalent to programming a bunch of carefully chosen if statements. But of course, the benefit is that you can do this over a huge number of attributes very, very quickly without having to do all this yourself. Right? So yes, it's not much better than doing it yourself, but it's much quicker. So let's have a look at this in some code. We're going to change and use a different piece of software today right, because for things like classification and prediction, we're going to use Weka. It's a very simple tool that makes applying things like decision trees very, very simple. And it has some of the same data cleaning processes as R does, right, but in a graphical form. We've already prepared our credit report. right? So we've got credit data where we have a number of inputs, things like how much money do they make, whether they've defaulted on any credit before. We have these in a file. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to find my file. That's going to be in here. Right. Now you can load various file types, JSON files for example, we're going to load a CSV, it's our credit data. So we have about 600 rows of whether or not people, I think it was Japan this data originally came from, were given credit or not. So we have things like age, debt, marital status, whether they're a customer of the bank already, whether they've got a driving license, what their current credit score is, and you can see that what Weka has done is load all these, work out whether they're nominal or ordinal values, numerical values already. So for example, credit score is a numerical value, and you can see here a quick histogram that shows the different types and whether they've been approved for credit. Approved, at the bottom, Weka has interpreted as the output or the classification that we're trying to achieve. Right? So in this data set, we have 307, you can almost see that font, 307 approved and 383 denied credit. So let's train up a decision tree and see how it does. So we're going to go to classify. We're going to select a decision tree, so we're going to choose, uh, we could choose 0R, let's not. So we're going to go down to trees and J48, which is your standard decision tree. We're going to use a percentage split and we're going to select 70% for our training set. This one doesn't have a validation set. We're going to be predicting whether or not they were approved and then we're going to train up like this. What happens is Weka will train the decision tree and then it will produce for us some measurements of its accuracy. You can see it's correctly classified 85% of the testing set, which is good. Right? I mean, it means a lot to these people, so maybe those 15% could be a bit aggrieved. And then we get a confusion matrix down here. So we're saying that of the yeses, 
The 76 were correctly allowed credit and 22 were denied incorrectly. And of the no's, 100 were correctly denied and 9 were accidentally allowed. Right? So that's the error we can see here. Now the nice thing about decision trees is we can now look at these rules and see what they are. So we can go into visualise tree. And so you can see that, that the most important attribute that it's decided on is whether or not they defaulted on a loan prior to this. So anyone that defaulted on a loan before is immediately denied credit. If they haven't defaulted on a loan, then it starts to look at whether they're employed. And if they are, it's going to give them credit. Right? But it's a simple rule system, and it's the best it can do, given the amount of data we've got. If they aren't employed, then it's going to look at their income. Maybe they're self-employed. It's going to make a decision, then whether they're married, where they live, and their income again. Right? So you can use attributes multiple times to make complex decision-making processes. So this is a very simple tree which actually has performed pretty well on this data set. I mean, it's not a huge data set, but 85%. That's not too bad. Once you've used a classifier, so KNN or a decision tree, to classify your data, what you want to know really is how well is it performed on your testing set. So you could quite simply calculate accuracy. So what is the percentage of the time that we were correct? Right? And obviously that's going to be hard to do for many classes. But for credit, yes or no, 85% is not bad. Right? If, our, if our average was guessing at 50%, it's quite a lot better than that. There's another type of classifier that's perhaps a little bit more common these days and a little bit more powerful than decision trees, and that's the support vector machine. So what is a support vector machine? Well, what we're going to try and do is separate our classes based on a line or a plane or some separation in the attributes that we have. Um, but what we're going to do is try and maximise the separation between these two classes to make our decision more effective. So let's imagine we have two attributes, just like before. So this is attribute one. This is attribute two. Don't forget, this is labelled training data, so we know which classes these are in already. This is not like clustering. So maybe we have some data over here, and we have maybe some data over here. Now, obviously, this is a quite an easy one. We're going to try and find a decision boundary between these two classes that maximises the separation. So, for example, one decision boundary we could pick would be this one here. Right? But it's not perfect because it's very close to this point here and it's very close to this point here. So these are on the fringes of being misclassified. Right? And you've got to think that this is just a training set. If we start to bring in testing data that may appear around here or around here, maybe that's the stuff that gets misclassified. Right? So what a support vector machine will do is pick a line between these data points where the distance to the nearest point is maximised. These nearest points are called support vectors. Right? So this margin here is going to be as big as we can get it. So you can imagine that if we move this around, the margin is going to get bigger and smaller. Now, the nice thing about support vector machines, in a kind of almost reverse PCA approach, you can convert this into a higher dimensional space and perform quite complicated separation of things that aren't really obviously separable like this. Things that are essentially, we have to have a non-linear decision made. Right? So not a simple line, something more complex like a curve. A lot of the time, we're going to look at precision and recall. So recall is a measure of, for all the positive things, for all the people that should have been granted credit, how many of them actually were, right? So we should have said a yes, how many of the times did we actually say yes, right? And that's a measure of how good is our algorithm at spotting that class. And precision is, of the ones it spotted, what percentage of them were correct? You can imagine a situation where your recall might be very high because you've just said yes to everyone, right? So yes, you spotted every single person that should have got credit but also your precision is low because you were giving it to loads of people who shouldn't have had it. Right? So a really good algorithm is going to be one that has a very high precision and a very high recall. Right? And we combine these measures into one score, F1 or F score, and this is going to be a value between 0 and 1, where 1 is absolutely perfect and 0 is doesn't work at all. Where did our training data come from? In this case, we got our training data off the internet. Right. But if you're a credit agency, then what you're going to do is you're going to use humans to make these initial decisions. Then you're going to train a machine and you're going to test to see whether it can do as well as people can do. Right? Maybe there's nuance there that this decision tree couldn't capture. Those 15% of people that were misclassified, is there something we could have done better to help those people? Right? So what you'll find that happens in, you know, practically is you'll train the system, but maybe you don't rely on it entirely. Maybe for the very obvious yeses, we can use a decision tree or some other classifier to just say, yep, those people are fine. Maybe for the obvious noes, we can say, no, nope, they're not going to get credit. But for the edge cases, the people in the middle, maybe that's when we bring a human into the loop. So in our data set, for our training examples, we're going to have all of the attributes, and then we're crucially going to have an already known label for that data that says, yes, that person was denied credit or they were allowed credit. Right? So we're going to use those training examples of 
input attributes and output yes or no decisions to train our classifier and then we're going to test the results and whether or not it'll work when we use our unseen test data for unknown cases. Classifiers let us put groups into discrete labels, yes or no, A, B or C, depending on what our situation is. They're very powerful and as long as you've got enough training data, we should be able to use them to make real life decisions. Uh, what we want to do going forward is start to move from just yes and no to can we actually produce output values? You know, can we regress actual values out of these algorithms? Let's talk a little bit about something more powerful, that's artificial neural networks. Right? Now, any time in the media at the moment when you see the term AI, what they're actually talking about is machine learning and what they're talking about is some large neural network. Right? Now let's keep it a little bit smaller for this, but let's imagine what we want.